quickly, we'll talk about uh, an update on the physics of strontium ruthenate. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the, the organizers for uh, setting up this meeting. I think it's a lot of work to do these things, and it's important in the current world situation that we do it. Um, what I thought I would do today, that's part of my title, it's the one I gave you, uh -huh, but when I can get my software to work. We, uh, I thought I would also devote a little bit of my time to give you some news from our department uh, about multi-component, discovery of multi-component superconductivity in cerium rhodium-2 arsenic-2. So specifically, what I wanted to do today very much was to talk about new things. So uh, while my introduction doesn't luckily contradict anything that Jörg said, it's, uh, the content of the talk isn't going to include some of the things he told me I was going to talk about. Uh, so I'll give you a very quick uh, introduction to current issues. But then there's two new things uh, I'd like to talk about. Uh, first of all, new night shift measurements as a function of field at low temperatures uh, by Stuart Brown. Uh, the, uh, for which the uh, uh, preprint, preprint appeared on the archive yesterday. Uh, then there's some brand new stuff completely unpublished from our group about the elastocaloric effect, which I'll run you through. And then I'll move on to the, uh, the section on cerium rhodium 2 arsenic 2. So I've got a lot to cover, uh, and therefore I thought that I would dispense with a long introduction. Uh, now, since Jörg partly gave it, that's an uh, even better decision. Uh, what, what I would say, though, is that uh, in this Zoom age, I recently gave a much longer talk and review on strontium ruthenate, where I put in all the introductory stuff and the citations to everybody. Um, and so if people are interested, they can find it on that URL. I'm conscious of the fact that uh, if it's on Google, it's not available to Chinese colleagues who don't have uh, a VPN somewhere. Uh, so anybody in that situation can just email me afterwards and I'd be happy to send them the set slides of that talk. So I thought that instead of doing a proper uh, introduction, again, uh, going with the age, I'd go into Twitter mode and uh, condense everything into a few short tweets. So tweet one, this is what strontium ruthenate is. Uh, it's a highly disorder sensitive, unconventional superconductor. Uh, and it's also uh, some kind of a benchmark uh, correlated electron metal, which has been quite widely used in that community. What it is not is uh, a platform for non-abelian quantum computation. I thought I would put that in because uh, we're all spiritually next door to station Q at the moment. Uh, Station Q, I think, decided that point for themselves after a workshop on the topic in 2007. Uh, but one of the things I'll move on to is describing how the NMR uh, that was done last year uh, put a final nail into the, into the coffin of that particular idea. Now, what's more topical is what strontium ruthenate may be, and we've heard a number of these things already from Jörg. Um, uh, although uh, the existing NMR ruled out some uh, P-wave order parameters, it didn't rule out them all. So up until very recently, it could, be, could have been an odd parity superconductor with an in-plane D-vector. It might be an even parity superconductor with a two-component order parameter. That might break time reversal symmetry, even still in the bulk, although it's interesting to hear what Jörg was saying there. It might be an example of some rather exotic physics. So for instance, uh, strange to me models of interorbital uh, and interplane pairing, and some of this will be discussed very briefly by Daniel Eichterberg tomorrow. A paper has also appeared this week that I find intriguing from Thomas Scafidi, where he's talking about a natural degeneracy that would happen in a model, an idealized model of a material like strontium ruthenate that could have a mixed, even and odd order parameter. I won't talk more about that at all today, but I think uh, that's a really interesting preprint and the uh, people in the field might, will, might like to go and look at it. So that was the, there's the Twitter introduction. Now I will talk a little bit more about past history, but very contextualized to do with the NMR uh, and with the goal of setting up uh, the discussion of the most recent NMR experiments. So, the issue of studying the spin susceptibility in strontium ruthenate has been uh, hugely important over the years. 
because in almost all superconductors, there's this fundamental battle going on between superconducting coherence energy and spin polarization energy, Zeeman energy, uh, in terms of the parallel susceptibility. So if you have a superconductor condensing from a metal with some parallel susceptibility that we'll just put as the normal state, normalizing it uh, to one on the, in these units, then when you go into the superconducting state, if you're making singlet Cooper pairs, spin singlet Cooper pairs are intrinsically non-magnetic objects. So you are removing them from any chance of getting polarization energy gain and therefore polarization. So at sufficiently low temperatures in a spin singlet superconductor, the condensate wins, the pairing energy wins out over the polarization energy and uh, the T equals zero field equals zero limit of the spin susceptibility goes to zero. That's why it was so uh, influential on the field and the interpretation of the physics of strontium ruthenate that for about 20 years, we believed uh, that the spin susceptibility measured by the NMR night shift stayed completely temperature independent as you went through TC. That is not only completely contrary to a singlet interpretation, it's actually very restrictive on the kind of order parameters that you could have within a triplet interpretation. So it was a result containing a tremendous interpretive power. Now, as the years went by, uh, there were many reasons for getting worried about this situation. But the most direct one for me was that there are two uh, limits of this struggle between uh, spin polarization and condensate formation. The superconductor wins out at low fields, but if the struggle is going on, the field will win out at high fields, and that will give you critical field behavior, which is known as Pauli limiting. And the big problem we had uh, up until last year in strontium ruthenate was that it didn't show the superconductor, it didn't show the, uh, the signs of the competition in the superconducting state at low, supposedly low fields, but it did show signs of the competition in the Pauli limiting. And it just seemed to me to be very unlikely that, that you could ever cook up a way of both happening at once. So our contribution to, to helping with progress in this stemmed from uh, Cliff Hicks's invention of piezo uh, uh, electric controlled uh, devices for uh, 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 putting on uniaxial pressure. And as has been alluded to by Jörg, when you put on the uniaxial pressure as carefully as you can, you discover that you're able to take strontium ruthenate that had a TC in the best crystals of 1.5 Kelvin, make it have a TC of about 3.5 Kelvin, and that when you reach 3.5 Kelvin, you did it at about the strain where you believed from calculations that you were tuning through a Van Hove singularity and undergoing a Lipschitz transition. And then on the other side, the superconducting transition temperature dropped away like a stone. Now note that asymmetry. We're going to come back to that asymmetry later in the talk. For now, I'll talk about one of the spin-offs, and one of the spin-offs of creating this, if you like, new, strontium, new homogeneous strontium ruthenate with a TC of 3.5 Kelvin uh, was that it happily induced Stuart Brown to get interested in going and doing NMR under strain on that type of sample. And very soon after they did that at UCLA, they discovered that the night shift, which is the proxy here for the spin susceptibility, did not remain constant as you went through TC. It actually showed a pronounced kink. Depending on details of NMR and the sites and everything, it can be an upward or downward kink. But in both of these cases, the spin susceptibility is going downwards. That was exciting because uh, the first result had been checked many times in the unstrained material. So I personally thought we were probably going to have a really cool um, multi-component superconducting phase diagram involving a transition between different superconducting states of different symmetries at some finite strain. Uh, you, what you hope for isn't what you're always what you see. Instead, what Stuart discovered was that as he detuned the strain towards zero strain, he was always still getting this drop in the spin susceptibility below TC. And he was able to show that he would get that drop in spin susceptibility when he did the NMR measurements at very low powers, low pulse energies. Whereas if he increased the pulse energies to, to levels equivalent to the ones that have been used in the Kyoto experiments, 
uh, he saw a result similar to theirs. So we, as well as publishing our own work, we contacted Kenji Ishida about this, and he did something really as direct as you could imagine. He took the uh, same sample on which he had this famous 1998 result, and he repeated the experiment, first of all, at the same uh, pulse energy, energy as was before, and those two points there are equivalent to those points there. So in other words, when he, when he uh, kept the same conditions, he got the same answer. But when he took the advice that uh, UCLA group had given him about uh, how to reduce the pulse power, he quickly confirmed that he indeed saw a rather substantial drop of the night shift as you entered the superconducting state. So this uh, uh, was obviously a really important result. And the combination of these results more or less said that strontium ruthenate could not have a K-independent ve vector or a K-independent a K D vector. And uh, the state that was so relevant for potential quantum computation in Majorana fermions in vortex cores did have a K-independent D vector order parameter. So I would say that 19, uh, 2019 was the year when uh, that particular uh, dream uh, died. Uh, or was killed. So Mark Fisher calls Stuart Brown the killer of dreams, by the way. Now, however, there was something left to think about. There was definitely residual business because that spin susceptibility isn't going to zero. It's going to about 40% of the normal state value. Now that can be for two reasons. One, it could be due to field excited quasi particles because we're actually at a pretty high field here, about 30, 40, 45% of HC2 or it could be due to a residual condensate response. And once you've taken spin orbit coupling and some other things into account, you think that that could still be a P wave order parameter, but not one with a K independent D vector. So the key question that was remaining was how much of that residual night shift is due to the condensate and how much is due to excited quasiparticles. So Stuart and Aaron Cronister and Andre Pustogao have been busy again. And what they've done is a really comprehensive experiment. They went to 25 millikelvin, and they made sure, and they applied in-plane fields, but a detail which is important for strontium ruthenate aficionados, they did those both along the 100 direction and the zone diagonal 110 direction. And for that and all the shifts that they were looking at, they got completely consistent results within the error bars that are shown there. So you start in the normal state, as you uh, uh, just go below HBC2, the night shift drops rapidly, and then it falls off more gradually towards lower and lower fields. This is all at the lowest temperatures. Anybody who knows the history of strontium ruthenate would know straight away that that's reminiscent of what you see in the heat capacity. And in fact, what Stuart has done here is to take the heat capacity data of Nishizaki and colleagues and to just make a very small extrapolation, their actual measurement was at 90 milliK. He's extrapolated it to T equals zero and normalized it to the normal state value. And what you see is that within the error bars of this experiment, the heat capacity data are, are, are un indistinguishable in these normalized units from the spin susceptibility data. That's an extremely uh, significant observation because the heat capacity is only uh, sensitive to the excited quasiparticles that are being excited from the condensate, whereas the spin susceptibility could also have been uh, uh, sensitive to the condensate. And this result says that within our experimental error, all of the spin susceptibility response in the NMR is coming from the excited quasiparticles, and none of it is coming from the condensate. Now, experimental error is important here, and it's something we've thought about a lot. Our best estimate is to say that when you think of everything that could have gone wrong with the analysis and the experimental uncertainties, we are measuring zero to within an error of about 10%. So I think that the empirical statement is that this latest NMR measurement puts a, a limit of 10% on the residual uh, spin susceptibility or the condensate contribution to the spin susceptibility in strontium ruthenate. So I'll give that to you as an experimental fact, but uh, if I were a theorist, I wouldn't be uh, devoting the rest of my life to working on triplet uh, theories, really, of any kind after I saw a number like that. Okay, so now I'd like to move to something even newer. 
Uh, but I think it, it, it ties in well with the goals of this workshop, as you'll see, it's about different forms of order. So what we were doing in our group was to follow on from discussions with Matthias Ikeda and Ian Fisher, uh, who had a really, uh, did a really smart experiment that they published last year, where they took a version of the, a commercial version of Cliff Hicks's uh, strain cell design, and they did a standard strain measurement except for two additions. They put a thermocouple on, so they were measuring the sample temperature, and they applied a high frequency ripple to the piezos. So they modulated the piezos in an AC way on top of the DC strain background, and they looked at the thermometer response that was locked into that strain ripple. Now, in the paper, they described the physical significance of this in a particular way, which is different to what I'm going to do now. Uh, uh, but the, the, the way that I think about it, which is really helpful for me, is to call, this is called the elastocaloric effect. And the, uh, the helpful thing is a close analogy with the magnetocaloric effect. Now, it's helpful for me because I've worked on the magnetocaloric effect. I'll try and make it helpful to you in a moment. But the key point about the magnetocaloric effect is that if you have a system with a field-dependent entropy, then you will measure a, a field de a, 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 a dependence uh, of temperature on field, which will be directly proportional to the field dependence of that entropy. And in the uh, elastocaloric effect, you just take out field and put in strain, and it's basically the same thing. So they are directly measuring with this AC technique, that delta T delta strain, and what they're getting, what you then do is directly get information out about the strain derivative of the entropy of the system. So Matthias, we talked to Matthias Ikeda about collaborating on this in strontium ruthenate. He was going to come across to Dresden and work with us on it. Obviously, with coronavirus, that all went out the window. But he talked with us on by Skype and on Zoom and things about it. And luckily, we have Yusheng Li still working in Dresden, and he did his PhD on AC heat capacity. So he was in a very uh, good place to do a really high precision measurement of the elastocaloric effect in uh, strontium ruthenate. And there's the precision. He has a measurement precision of about two microkelvin per root hertz. So here is a map of this uh, strain derivative of the temperature. Uh, or the, you know, the, the expressed as the value of the AC temperature change. And that map is in AC temperature changes of order of plus or minus one millikelvin around the uh, externally uh, stabilized value. So here's what the map looks like. And now I'm going to try and go through it with you to show you what kind of information it contains. So first of all, if we go at 8 Kelvin and we do just look at a line cut across the graph at 8 Kelvin, I'm showing that to you there. And remember what we're fundamentally measuring here is the strain derivative of the entropy. So this kind of fano like looking profile is exactly what you get in a derivative when the fundamental quantity had a peak. So that signal in the elastocaloric effect is telling us about the big peak that we're getting in the entropy at 8 Kelvin and the density of states. And that's not surprising because we're tuning the system through a Van Hove singularity. So that is a very, very high precision uh, measurement of the physics of the way the density of states is changing as we're tuning through the Van Hove singularity. I'd like you to notice that you know, if you just eyeball it, it's reasonably symmetric. So now if you go down to 6 Kelvin, you see the same background change corresponding to the entropic peak to do with the Van Hove singularity, but you very clearly resolve a small kind of couple of hundred of micro Kelvin uh, temperature change in the way we were doing this experiment at a very well-defined peak. You go down further, you see the peak gets even more prominent, and you go down further, you see the peak is still very prominent in the raw data, but the uh, signature of the elastocaloric effect at lower strains has changed a lot. But that's because you've gone into this region where everything has changed on that plot, and everything has changed on that plot because on the same sample you measure the heat capacity and you, and you define TC from the uh, 
uh, the specific heat anomaly. And what you see is that that is being done in the superconducting state. Okay, so there's, uh, we could go in at some length into how to interpret that particular pattern of elastic caloric data in a superconductor. But what's then very striking is that the locus of this second peak is that yellow stripe which is coming down here. Okay, now the aspect of the mu SR that uh, is uh, less widely debated than the time reversal symmetry breaking signal is the fact that when they were coming down in temperature at high strain, at, uh, uh, at high strain in the muon rig, they saw very clear evidence at about 6.9 Kelvin that they were entering a phase of some kind of magnetic order. So they interpret that phase as being a, a density wave. I'm sure there will be people from that collaboration who could answer your questions on that. I'm just going to call it magnetic order of some kind. So it now looks pretty clear that that stripe and the locus of these peaks is the thermodynamic or elastocaloric response to entering that phase. So you have a magnetic phase here. Here you have the superconducting phase. And even though the density of states change across the Van Hove singularity at higher temperatures is really very symmetric, the superconductivity response to that change of density of states is rather asymmetric. And this now looks very much like a, a, an intertwined order phase diagram, where in fact, it would look at first sight as if the uh, magnetic order is competing with the superconductivity and killing the superconductivity as it onsets. Okay, so, but you know, the, the really cool thing for me was that uh, I'm not gonna say that doing the experiment Yu Sheng did was easy. It was easy for him because he already, already set up specific heat, but it was, far, far easier than uh, mapping this phase diagram out would have been with muons. That would have taken several beam times and a lot of effort. This was about maybe a couple of days data taking to, to get that phase diagram information there. So I think that this is cute and uh, significant ultimately for strontium ruthenate physics. But the really uh, important thing is that this technique is remarkably easy to implement if you are already doing a strain experiment. And if you're interested in a strain experiment, you're bound to have a strain derivative of your entropy. So whatever spectroscopy that our group is going to do in the future, I would like our group to have a thermometer on the sample so that we're getting thermodynamic and spectroscopic data simultaneously. I think it's really a great development. So, and very nice work from the Stanford group. Now, back to Jörg's talk. The question people are going to ask is, if you're so sensitive here, and we've asked it ourselves, of course, if you're so sensitive, does the elastocaloric effect show any signatures of this time reversal breaking signal? So the time reversal breaking dotted line is about there. And in the data we have so far, we don't see any convincing signatures of everything. But there's actually a lot more we can do. We can up our sens sensitivity here we can look for dissipation as well as looking for, uh, this is the real part of the response, the non-dissipative part of the response. There are a lot of extra knobs that we can turn with very high sensitivity. So we haven't seen anything yet, but I wouldn't convincingly rule out the possibility that we might in future. So I started uh, late. I wish Mr. Chairman to realize that. Uh, that's all I'm gonna say about strontium ruthenate. Uh, in, as, in the same way as Subia, Maybe I should take questions on strontium ruthenate now. It's going to be a change of material after this. Sure, uh, we can absolutely do that. Uh, we have already a first question by Steve Kivos. Yeah, so uh, Andy, do we know what the nature of this magnetic phase is? Is it, is it ferromagnetism? So, so the statement in the mu SR, and I'm this, uh, all we know is the mu SR. And the statement in the mu SR is that the oscillations look like the, the expectation for a density wave, uh -huh. spin density wave. But I don't want to be the guy who really comments to you on exactly how that inference was drawn. I mean, I assume it strikes everybody that the phase diagram now looks like. Oh, it really does. <laughs> yes, indeed. It struck me too, don't worry. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and uh, yeah, visualization is a very powerful thing, isn't it? We yeah. have a question from Igor Mazin. Igor, you can unmute yourself. 
Okay, Jasjit, thank you. Uh, thank you. Every time I listen to Andy, he comes up with some new and unexpected data. That's amazing. Uh, but before I ask Matlai, I want to comment on uh, Steve's question, that in neutron scattering, the renormalization of susceptibility at gamma point is estimated to be about three. And at the point corresponding to charge density waves is one sort, one sort zero. It's about 12, if I remember correctly. So it's highly that's likely. A, that's that, a zero strain. That's a zero strain, right. Yeah. But yeah, from an electronic structure point of view, it's not that dramatic change. So everything is possible, but I would say that it's highly likely that it is the same instability. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, totally wrong, but I'm trying to be careful. Yeah. All right. And in sort of continuing in the same vein, I was um, recently having uh, intense discussions with Steve Hayden, uh, who was measuring spin susceptibility um, by directly by neutrons. And we realized that his data do not fall on the same line as NMR and specific heat. And that's actually normal because specific heat is renormalized by electron phone coupling, which is weak but not negligible here. I think they're estimated about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 in lambda. On the other hand, uh, spin susceptibility is renormalized by uh, stoner factor in RPA fashion, uh, yeah. and specific heat does not. So in fact, you do expect them to be somewhat different and not necessarily falling on top of each other. It's just... It's now, okay, so I'd like, I'd be very, and I, 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 and I'm sure Stuart would really like to talk with you about that afterwards, uh, maybe in, you know, in private. Sure. But, what, sure. The, way that we, the way he's presented this is to normalize both to their normal state value. Yes, but it's also the way how uh, Ishida was presenting that in their paper on NMR. Yes, yes. But, but you know, but the plot of Stuart's, what we believe the significance there is in this comparison of normalized, uh, you know, he's, he's, what Stuart's put on is also the normalized heat capacity. Uh, but, right. but I'd be very happy. I think it would be great to talk with you about that privately. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, we looked a lot of that. I mean, in some sense, I'm saying that uh, even if they were not, they might accidentally, depending on the type of experiment you are doing and kind of uh, how you normalize, they may or may not be exact on top of each other. But even if they are not, that still does not contradict the idea that they both come from the same um, normal quasi particles and with no contribution from quantum state. So everything is consistent with this. I'm just agreeing with what you are saying, okay. but uh, a word of caution. Uh, that, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Pavel Volkov, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, my question is about the, the change in the data between 4 Kelvin and 2 Kelvin. <clears throat> it seems that this uh, big feature, which, uh, you know, from 8 to 4 Kelvin, uh, the, the, the change in sign occurs at around, I don't know, minus 0.5 uh, percent strain. At 2 Kelvin, it shifts to the left. And on the other hand, another feature appears at uh, around minus 0.2, minus 0.3 uh, in, in, in TAC yeah. versus strain plot. So uh, uh, can you uh, tell whether, you know, uh, the, the feature at larger strain can be explained due to reconstruction of the Fermi surface due to spin density wave and uh, the feature at lower strain, minus 0.3, whether it is just uh, superconductivity? So, so the feature, the, the, this feature is definitely just superconductivity. Now, um, I, I tried to give it very simply to give people a handle, but remember that, and what I said, which is a little misleading, is that it's proportion that, that this quantity is proportional to the strain derivative of the entropy. What I didn't make explicit is that, of course, the heat capacity itself is a function of the strain. Right, and so this isn't just a prefactor, and what you're really measuring is the combination of the strain dependence of those two quantities. Right, mm -hmm. and it, because a lot happens to the heat capacity as you go into the into a super the superconducting state, uh, I, I'm going to write my intuition off and say that it's some consequence of that. And once we've analyzed the data, these data are very recent. Once we've analyzed them and thought about them properly, we will end up being able to explain that in benignly in terms of the superconductivity. 
and the large feature at minus 0.6 to minus 0.7, why does it shift from 4 Kelvin to 2 Kelvin? Is it the effect of the reconstruction by spin density wave? Well, Just I mean, I think if you, if you look at it, so now if you can see my cursor, you can look at the yellow line on the apparent phase diagram, right? And that looks entirely consistent with what the phase boundary of a magnetic state looks like in in a typical phase diagram. So I would say it's that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Andy, we have uh, about uh, seven to eight minutes left. So... Uh, but I st we started late. We started late, and I watched. <laughs> You, you, so you're me, great. About let me go on. Right. Now, I'll okay. suggest you, you continue so, so we can have a few more minutes for yeah. questions. So although I don't have much time, I really want to stress at the, at this part of the talk that I'm the rapporteur here of the work of other people. So the work has been going on in our department on cerium rhodium 2 arsenic 2 for about three or four years now, and nothing's ever been published because they were doing an extremely thorough job. So the particular players that I should be crediting are Xun Hun Kim, Javier Landetta, Elena Hassinger, who's Javier's boss, Manuel Brando, who's Daniel's boss, and Christoph Geibel, who gives tremendous insight. We're also now working with theory collaborators, including Daniel, who will speak about other things tomorrow. So the reason Christoph was very, uh, Christoph and Xun Hun were very interested in, in uh, cerium rhodium 2 arsenic 2 is that the cerium environment is a really is a, is a strange and potentially fruitful one. So it's in a local C4V point group, but the overall, so it's inversion broken with respect to the neighboring uh, uh, arsenics and rhodiums, but there's a global inversion point uh, with respect to all the cerium planes in the system. So they, they grew it and they started looking at it. And uh, it's a, an archetypal condo lattice system with a condo temperature of about 40 Kelvin. It has, uh, as you would expect from that, a very large uh, electronic specific heat of order, you know, uh, a joule per mole Kelvin squared. And C upon T also shows this uh, nearly uh, minus uh, log T divergence which is not understood by me, but it's uh, typically seen in systems which are at or near quantum criticality. So it's a, a heavy fermion type condo system uh, sitting uh, pretty near quantum criticality. The other thing you can do is the standard trick of integrating up the electronic component of the heat capacity to get, they call it magnetic, I would rather say the electric, uh, electronic uh, entropy and as you often see in heavy fermions, the electronic entropy saturates, but it doesn't saturate at R log two, it saturates at R log four, indicating that you have some, a quasi quartet of the crystal fields. And actually what's important to understanding the superconductivity we believe is that it's only a quasi quartet. These are, there's two doublets and they're separated by an energy of order 30 Kelvin. So they're very close, but they aren't close on the scale of uh, 300 millikelvin superconductivity. And this next slide shows that that's what you have here. So you have a susceptibility signal very clear and a heat capacity signal showing that you have a superconductivity at 2TC 2 270 millikelvin and with an anomaly which shows you that it's the heavy electrons that have caused the superconductivity. So this is a new heavy fermion superconductor. It also has a second distinct feature here, which we've called T naught, you know, in the, in the kind of uh, call it naught or star if you don't know what it is. But it's there and it can be followed as a function of field and temperature in much more data than I'm showing you. And what we know is that there's no associated magnetic signature. So we wonder that plus this unusual crystal field configuration, whether we're thinking about multipolar physics in here as well as superconductivity. So like the quantum criticality, I'm not going to say anything more about multipolar physics or, or superconductivity or, or, or quantum criticality, sorry. But I will now talk more about the superconductivity. So what, once they had the, the transition, the experimentalists uh, involved made a very careful measurement of the, uh, the uh, upper critical field. 
And for the orientation where the field is in the plane, it looks reasonably standard. But when the field is out of the plane, it looks highly non-standard and there's a pronounced kink. And that really got everybody's attention. And it's one of the reasons that we haven't published for so long, because uh, Xiong Hung and others were very much aware of uh, uh, models of local Rashba, layered local Rashba systems, which said that you could even predict getting these kind of kinks. But the kink in the critical field would be associated with two distinct uh, superconducting order parameters separated by a thermodynamically relevant phase transition, a proper thermodynamic phase transition. So we decided, or they decided, that they didn't want to publish a speculation that they had two superconducting phases without getting some proof. So what they went away with that did was very careful susceptibility, magnetization, and uh, magnetostriction experiments, all of which show really clear anomalies, not small, not tiny things, really clear anomalies at about four Tesla. And if I plot them on the locus of this diagram, that's how they look. So we believe that that, that work has got us to the stage where we can definitely say that we have two-phase superconductivity. There are two phases within the superconducting state and they're separated by a line of phase transitions, which we can identify with multiple thermodynamic measurements. So that then stimulates uh, thinking about the theory, and this is where we've been working with Daniel and others. And again, just to, to re-summarize what I said a moment ago, this cerium site is interest, interesting because locally inversion is broken. In other words, the atoms above are rhodium and below are arsenic. But there is an inversion point uh, from cerium plane to cerium plane. So in those circumstances, uh, Daniel uh, knows how to write a full Hamiltonian, but for the purposes of this talk, he's given me a very potted version so I can say what the, the key points are. And you have an allowed Rashba energy because of the local inversion breaking. And then you have a more standard hopping term uh, between the planes. and the TARs are pseudo-spin matrices, and so that will be for you to ask him about, not me. But the point is that there's a competition that's expected in that kind of Hamiltonian. So here I'm drawing the two cerium planes with an inversion point put in, so you can see that there is inversion symmetry between them. That T sub C term favors the formation of what we call an even parity state. In other words, superconductivity whose gaps, gap phase is the same on both layers and then all layers. The Rashba term, however, favors what we'll call here an odd parity state. And all we mean is a state whose, uh, whose sign of the gap function reverses from layer to layer. So some people use pair density wave for that, uh, for that uh, uh, physics, but that's the physics we're talking about. Now, in the model, the even parity state certainly has the higher TC, but because of the, the, the Rashba effect combined with interplane hopping physics, it's suppressed by a C-axis field. And it turns out that, uh, uh, you know, that's general physics. What you see is going to depend on parameters. And our best estimate of parameter strength is that the Rashba energy is about twice the strength of TC, T sub C, this hopping in cerium rhodium 2 arsenic 2. And that makes the theory become very similar to an idealized model that was published six, a year, six years ago by Yoshida, Sigrist, and Yanase. What it allows us to do then is to take the observed phase diagram with the two superconducting phases, model using our model, but it ends up being very similar to that published one of, of the Sigrist group. And what we're then able to do is to identify S superconducting phase one as the even parity phase and superconducting phase two as the odd parity phase. So this isn't really intertwined order, but at least it's the appearance of two thermodynamically distinct phases within one superconducting state. And uh, something that people have commented that's always really struck me is that multi-phase superconducting phase diagrams are a kind of zeroth order expectation of many forms of unconventional superconductivity. But to my count, I guess we have 50 to 100 known unconventional superconductors now. 
We only have two or three cases where we have a proven superconducting phase diagram with multiple phases. So we're pretty excited about this and we're desperately trying finally to write a paper which we hope to have on the archive soon. So I've overrun my time probably. I won't read out the summary in the future prospects, but thanks for your attention. And I will be happy to send all questions about the second part of the talk to Daniel Eichterdorf. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I will use my prerogative as chair to start asking a question. It is about the second part of your talk, but uh, what I was wondering is, it, it seemed, if I understood correctly, you have two different uh, reduced representations or two different gaps that transform as two different reduced representations. So what about the relative phase between them? Uh, is there, uh, you know, when you go to from SC2 to SC1, is it just a, a first order transition or is it a phase where you have coexistence of both odd parity and even parity? So experimentally, and I'll get, and I will keep my promise of passing you to Daniel in a second. Experimentally, it is, uh, we see no coexistence. We see something very sharp and we don't see hysteresis. Okay. So that can't prove to us that it, that doesn't prove it isn't a first order transition. Um, but if it were not to be a first order transition, that meeting of transition lines isn't allowed thermodynamically. But we have the additional uncertainty that it's possible that that quadrupolar feature comes in as a fourth line joining this point. So we don't actually have really firm thermodynamic proof of whether this is a first or a second order transition, but we don't resolve any coexistence. Okay. Daniel, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll just say that the theory does clearly predict a first order transition between those two states okay. there. All right. Okay, so uh, first question is by Elio Koenig. Uh, Elio, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. So oh, uh, I'm also interested in the second part. So uh, if I understand right, you have only it's only based on the theory that you call them even and odd. But do you have any experimental evidence that this is odd pairing no. and actually odd pairing? Do you understand it right? Would it mean it's completely based on the theory? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it would be true. And, and and you might want to ask our theorist why it's the only possible explanation that could happen for this. Daniel, do you want to add something? I will, I will discount from your questions tomorrow, you know, question time tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so I'll just say that um, it's not easy to envision other, uh, other explanations, and this is a very natural material for which you get this kind of physics. Um, so if you have other possibilities, go ahead and suggest them and uh, add to the debate. Uh, okay, uh, but uh, just following up, uh, you mentioned this phase, you describe as a pair density wave. Does it, does it break translational symmetry? Does, does no, the two cerium are inequivalent. Uh, so the two cerium sit, the cerium do not sit at the site of inversion symmetry. So there is two cerium per unit cell. I see, okay. So, so yeah, so no, it's not a pair density wave. It is really an odd parity state. Uh, yeah, but it is, this configuration has been referred to in the literature as a pair density wave before, though. Okay. Uh, I say. Steve has a question. Yeah, uh, so you have this orbital doublet. Is it clear that you're not getting a transition in which the, um, the point group symmetry of the crystal is changing? You're getting some sort of orbital ordering. So... We are concerned, or we, we have this second feature in the, uh, in the heat capacity at a slightly higher t temperature than the superconductivity. Uh -huh. And that does, you can, you can, with the eye of faith, you can follow that and you could map out a phase line, which you would claim was the phase line below which you'd entered some form of multipolar order, which is what you're saying, I think. Yeah. Right. Um, but we don't have that. I mean, there's there's much more data in the paper that will come out than uh, than uh, I'm showing here. So that could very well be also happening. But the the thing, the reason that we didn't include it in the discussion of the two superconducting phases is that that would be on this. See, my cursor on this phase diagram it would be a line doing something like this. 
So our argument is at these temperatures and fields, you're out of that ordered state. So it shouldn't qualitatively be changing whatever physics has led you to be seeing that second uh, uh, superconducting phase, we think. Well, just wondered, you know, you have two superconducting phases. One could be one that had no multipolar order and the other one could be well, one that did have multipolar order. Indeed. Um, indeed. But that would presumably show up structurally. It's not mysterious. Yes. It, it, well, you say uh, what what happened? What you know? Uranium, ruthenium, two, silicon, two. Okay. Okay. So I'm there in uranium, ruthenium, two, silicon, two. So, so in that case, you get to call it hidden order, and it becomes. Well, hidden. exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, but you see, this is really hidden order, Steve, because the anomaly associated with it is bloody tiny. Right on this scale, the uranium, ruthenium, two, silicon, two, hidden order heat capacity anomaly would be off the top of the screen. So, you know, so that's always really concerned me. I think there are definitely kinds of order, which empirically we know that we can see extremely well in some ways, but the real spectroscopic evidence or the diffraction evidence of it has been remarkably hard to pin down. What about things like thermal expansivity or something like that? Um, we, we, there, there is, we, we, we are indeed looking at that as well. So, yes. Okay, so next question is by Yi Ting uh, Shu. Apologies if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. Uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Okay, thanks. So, uh, just a question about the theoretical study uh, for the uh, R parity superconductivity. So, is the order parameter um, nodal or perhaps time reversal breaking? That's Daniel. Okay, uh, yeah, so I'll jump in. Um, so it doesn't need to be nodal. Um, what matters uh, for this physics to generically occur is that on the two cerium planes, um, there's a relative sign change in this gap. So it might be nodal because this is a heavy fermion material. So you can imagine that in a single plane, there may be a D wave order and mm -hmm. it may be nodal. I don't think there's any experiments to tell us whether it's nodal or not. I see, I see. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, next question, Pavel Vokov. Yeah. Uh, let me expand on the previous question. Uh, uh, so in the even parity phase, for example, the behavior of specific heat, uh, can it be experimentally interpreted as a signature of D wave or something? Can, is, is there anything you can say experimentally about the symmetry of the even parity order parameter? So I, I, I'll, I'll say something here. I, uh, I, we put a lot of effort into maximizing sample quality, but the sample quality may not be good enough to really know that, right? Because the resistance ratios aren't incredibly high. We don't have, for instance, quantum oscillations from the normal state. So myself, I would be concerned that anything, you know, that, that in the, with, the, with that level of disorder, trying to decide or, or fix on some nodal pattern may be pretty difficult. So certainly work for the future is to uh, improve these samples and then maybe we can get into that. And did you try to study the phase diagram under pressure or some external influence? Is there some, I don't know, other phases nearby? Uh, there's a, a, I, so as I say, I'm the rapporteur of this work. There may be some pressure work going on with uh, Christoph and Sium Hyung's group in collaboration. But I just honestly don't know if there is, and I certainly don't know the results of any. I mean, you know, be, we've been working on this specific problem and trying to sort out and get ourselves to the stage where we could make all this public. You know, we're very early. This is going to be the first paper coming out this autumn about this, and I hope that we're just at the beginning. What I really wanted to do today was to convince people that this is a really an interesting superconductor to add to the kind of pantheon. Okay, uh, we have a few more questions. I'll just go over the, the, the next four questions and then I'll close it. Uh, Daniel Komsky, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Yeah, okay. Hi, Andy. Uh, I have a question about uh, this uh, lowest doublet, which probably plays the most important role at low temperatures. Uh, if I describe it by effective pseudo spin, uh, what kind of uh, uh, properties uh, would it have? Uh, is it uh, equivalent to dipole or uh, quadrupolar, octopole, like for example, neodymium in pyrochlorus, 
Yeah. Also, lowest Kramer doublet, but it has dipole uh, octopole character. S Z so and S X are dipoles, and S Y is magnetic octopole. In cerium, in pyrochlorus, it's also the same. So uh, it may depend, of course, on the details of crystal fields. Uh, it may be different point symmetry, point group. But what's known about this one? Okay, so what kind well, of mul what kind of multiples are uh, allowed by uh, these doublet? Okay, so what's known and what's known by me are completely different things. I, I it's a really interesting question. I will we'll get back to you with an answer to it, but I can't answer that now. Uh, Daniel, how much did you think about this? So I do know a little. Um, I can tell you that in terms of um, the so-called uh, local C4V representations, when you look at double group representations, this doublet is a gamma seven representation, if that means anything to you, but it has uh -huh. um, the okay. same properties as a spin one half system. Yeah, 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 it's definitely, definitely Kramer doublet. I don't uh, doubt that it's spin one half. But for example, neodymium, which is combination, for example, of JZ plus three half and minus three half. And then in this case, it would be, uh, uh, if it's this combination, then it would be the two components are magnetic dipoles, but third component of this effective spin, pseudo spin, is magnetic octopole. And cerium and pyrochlorx is the same. So my question is maybe it's also the same here. Uh, I think, so I think if you look at the, so you're talking about making poly matrices in this doublet and asking about the symmetry character of those poly matrices, yes, is that right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so I can tell you that those poly matrices have the same symmetry properties as usual spin. So as um, X, Y, and Z components of, uh, of spin uh, operators. Does that answer your question? I can't say much more mm, than that. So. Well, uh, they are all, T odd, of course, yeah, but uh, as to the special symmetry, they may be different. No, as I think they the rotation... are different, for example, in pyroclots. Yes, and I think... So he, because I... otherwise uh, you wouldn't have any multiples, actually. Well, the multiples meant to come from this higher, this second doublet that sits 30 Kelvin above. Mm, yeah, but uh, below one Kelvin, probably the higher doublet is not relevant. Yeah. You have to leave this lower doublet. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I suspect that actually it might be indeed same story as in pyroclores when it's dipole octopole character. Maybe, but you have to check it indeed. Okay, well, thanks very much, Daniel. We will. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah. next question uh, Alexander uh, Liechtenstein. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, please. Um, if you are having trouble, just you can check check your question. I'll repeat, uh, but you are you are mute from my side. Uh, Why we wait? Let's uh, li the, 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 let's see. Uh, Jose Lorenzana, go ahead, please ask your question. Hello. Uh, if you go again to the phase boundary between the two superconductors in the last part of the talk. Uh, you would expect that if you sit right at the transition, the superfluid stiff, stiffness in the C-axis direction will become very soft exactly at the transition, right, in the, the internal transition. So did you look for some uh, signatures of that? For example, maybe resistivity appears again at that point or uh, other ways to look at, uh, or, well, uh, penetration depth, for example? So we haven't looked at penetration depth. I didn't say it, but if you look at the uh, inset here, we did check that there's no sign that we go away from zero resistivity anywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's an interesting point about the penetration depth, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, all right, so uh, in, in this case, well, let's uh, thank Andy and everyone else that gave the talk today. Uh, we will resume tomorrow in the same time. Thank you.